Okay, cool. Uh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to cover chapter 22, or I'm going to cover chapter 22, uh, debugging. And so just like Ron was saying at the start, like this chapter is definitely more practical. It's not as long. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably a little bit more accessible than some of the previous chapters. So I think this one is super practical because this is something that we're all going to constantly be doing regardless of what other, whatever programming language you want to work in. You're always going to be debugging, but it also is great to talk about this in regards to R um, so we can kind of see the tools that are available to debug in R. And so I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay. Can everybody see the slides? Yep. Right, cool. Yep. Yep. Got it. Okay. So I think these are the learning objectives that we should get out of this. Uh, the first thing is the book talks about kind of an overall general strategy to find and fix errors. Also, we're going to take some time exploring this function called traceback to help us uh, get some more context around where errors might be happening. And specifically, we'll be looking at how traceback prints a call stack. We're going to go a little bit further and look at interactive debugging and look at specifically using functions like browser and debug to kick us into an interactive debugger so that we can kind of play around with our functions and play around with our functions in a specific state. Then we're going to take on and explore some more challenging problems of debugging code that uh, may not necessarily allow us to do it interactively. And so we're going to talk about some ways of debugging code that way. And then we're also going to explore a handful of non-error problems that occasionally um, pop up during debugging. So things like how do we deal with warnings? How do we debug in um, how do we debug when there is no error, but we know that something's wrong? so on and so forth. And so we'll talk about some strategies and tools to do that. So the first thing that I do want to mention is that we are in a topic transition because this is the next section of the book. And so these next kind of four final chapters are going to be really focused on kind of general programming techniques. And this first one is about finding and fixing bugs. So finding and fixing issues within our code. And then the second, uh, kind of the final three chapters are going to be focused on finding and fixing performance issues. So how do we find those performance issues and how do we solve for them? Because it's really important to remember that R is not a fast language uh, in comparison to other languages that are available. It's just not a fast language. And that's not by anything that's necessarily wrong with the language. It's just by its design because R was purposely designed to do interactive data analysis easier for humans and not necessarily to make computers as fast as possible. And so if you're looking at trying to make your make your, your programs as fast as possible, then you might explore other programming languages that allow you some of those utilities to um, focus on um, improving performance. However, there are ways to um, make sure R is as fast as possible, and there are ways to translate code into other faster languages. And so those kind of three final chapters will focus on that. But really our focus today is gonna to be finding and fixing bugs. So with that, uh, the book kind of talks about this kind of introduction, really this kind of, this quote was kind of stated, and I thought it was a really kind of informative quote that finding, Finding your bugs, finding your bug is a process of confirming the many things that you believe are true until you find one which is not true. And so the book kind of really references this idea of having a process whenever you come across a bug or you come across an error or you come across something wrong with your code uh, because it will help you save time. You know, although that this process may have many, many steps, in the long run, it will save you time if you kind of follow this process. Now, this process should be really focused on not just assuming it's wrong, but actually having a systematic way you go about confirming and um, confirming and finding what's wrong within your code. And so I think this quotation, this quote does a really good job of like saying like, hey, have a process um, and follow this process anytime that you have any issues. And so the book really kind of starts off by setting up this idea of, okay, what are some of these general steps that you should follow when you're fixing errors? And I've kind of peppered in some of my, um, some of my process as well that I found to be a little bit to help out with debugging. Um, and then I'll highlight kind of what the book said specifically, but 
say you come across an error, um, one of the first things that I have to constantly remind myself is, is read and try and understand the error. Um, you know, this isn't in the book, but I have to constantly remind myself to do this, right? It's just the easy route to just say like, oh, I got an error. And then you just start Googling it, right? Rather, if you just take like a couple seconds to actually read the error and try and understand what the error is trying to tell you, it may lead you to um, some places to check to maybe fix your bug or to fix your issue within your code. And so I just constantly have to remind myself of, yeah, the red is scary to see in the console, but you usually, if you read it, you'll kind of find out what's wrong with it. Now, is that going to happen in every case? Absolutely not. Um, but if you are a Tidyverse user, there is a strong push that Tidyverse functions, or they're working on Tidyverse functions to make more informative errors. And so a great example of this would be the filter statement from dplyr. Um, basically, uh, whenever you do like a filter statement, if you're going to do some type of operation to do filtering, it asks that you use like the double equal sign. And this is something that I always forget. But if you get this error, what's nice about it is the Tidyverse team really, really focuses on trying to have informative errors to help you fix the problem. And so if you just see the error and then you just start kind of like not digging into the error and you try and start assuming things are wrong with it and trying to figure it out. But rather, if you just took the time to actually read the error, you find out, oh, OK, I just have to use double equal signs to fix this error. And so this is something that I constantly have to remind myself to do. In addition to this, it's going to help you learn more because you're going to see errors constantly pop up that are the same, the same, the same. So it's good to just read it, understand it and take the time to really understand what is R actually telling me. Can I just interrupt you and say that this has been my entire day is getting errors that I don't read carefully enough and then. You know, I spend an extra 30 minutes trying to fix something that I then went back and yeah. So, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned this. This is very apropos. <laughs> it's like, it's not it's it's not in the book, but it's like I have to constantly like it's it is kind of like it kind of is soul crushing when you see an error and you want to fix it as fast as possible. When in fact, if you just took like two seconds to read it, you might like solve your problem. So yeah, this is more like, of a yeah, the, the error that I made was I thought it was some wild thing, but I had actually like misnamed the, the variable that I was trying to call to. So that was the error. But of course, I didn't read it carefully. So I was just like trying to find some fancier thing instead of just like naming my variables the right things, which, you know, call me crazy. That's that's a that's a good idea. Right. The... I think the part of the problem is it's at least not with Tidyverse, but maybe other systems and also with Python. If I feel like the, my success rate of figuring out what something happened, why something went wrong by looking at the error message is pretty low. So I tend not to do it anymore. I like, uh, that, if that, when I, it's like my last resort. I, I look at what my code, do, I'll do just what you guys said. I'll go look at my code that I just entered and see if there's something jumps out at me. I mean, maybe you should do that first thing. Maybe it's something obvious. But like you said, it doesn't usually jump out. Like a misnamed variable, you won't notice it because you didn't notice when you typed it. So you probably won't right. notice it now right. that it yeah. had an S on the end when you defined it, it didn't or whatever. But yeah, I, I find that the problem is that I guess you just have to force yourself to look at those because it will save you time in the long run, even though you know, you know, it you know, might not be helpful. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I, I didn't mean to. I mean, I just, it's just funny. Like I, I only said it something because it just, it was very like apropos of like my day. So it's just funny that we're talking about this because I, I spent all day trying to like create a function that would take a bunch of like a long, long, long data and like create a series of like um, bar charts, you know, and um, so I'm I'm doing all the end quotes and all the bang bangs and hey man, <laughs> all right. I should have been paying more attention this whole time, but it's it was cool. I mean, I, I'm I'm it was it was i'm glad i finally getting into like doing something actually practical with it because it's like yeah the and i mean the other thing to, yeah. oh sorry ryan Go i ahead. was just gonna say like the only way you really learn is by making mistakes i i mean i i i truly think like you know you have to go through this stuff and just like hash it out that's that's all i was trying to say but yeah anyway and i think what's like challenging about this is like because it, probably the past like year or two, the Tidyverse team has really been focusing on making informative errors. Like I was so used to the old errors that I would, when I'd see it, I knew exactly what was wrong with it. But now right. it's like giving these new interfaces and I'm just like, oh shoot, now I have to reread all of this. 
but it's it's just one of those things like those common mistakes that pop up that could be easy fixes you're going to see the pattern over and over again, and you're going to see the same error message over and over again. And so instead of just like not knowing what the error message message is, if you can learn what it is, then it might lead you to like, Oh, here's an easier way to solve this. So, yeah. um, so say you run across an error that you don't know. Well, next step, Google it. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to add rather than Google it, GitHub it. Uh, if you can't GitHub it, stack overflow it. Right. More than likely if what you found you a problem, GitHub it. Um, go on GitHub and search for it. Um, there is um, ability to, um, there's some search features, like some features that you could search in Google. Oh, you can also, post an issue is what you're talking about? Yeah, you can post an issue. You could scan issues. Um, like like right. if you have like a, if you have like a bug that you've come across and you think it's inside of the package, like go on GitHub, find the package source, and then start scanning through some of the issues and find if like anybody else has had that um, that same kind of problem. I kind of ran into that last week with. Uh, I guess. Yeah, I, my yeah, first I thing would be you Google it. Something that was on. You mentioned something you saw as it was an issue, but I can't remember what it was now. Yeah, there's. I was doing something with it. Oh, it's going to come at me, but I had the same issue where I was just like, okay, I think there's something wrong with the package source. Yeah or there's a bug in the package source. I wonder if somebody's already put in an issue for it. Can't remember what it is now, but basically I, I, just, oh, go I've ahead. Never, I've never done any of that. I'm so afraid because some of the people who like respond, man, are not always the nicest people. <laughs> you got to put your filter on high. It's true. Probably. You, yeah. Yeah. Probably. But sometimes you will find the, the exact thing you found, problem you found. Yeah. By the way, I would add to this now uh, the newest thing, which is, you know, using chat GPT or one of those <laughs> or Bing or one of those things. I found that very helpful. Sometimes you just cut and paste your code in there and I'll like immediately know what, you know, can find that misspelled variable, that kind of thing pretty easily. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. So there are many different tools that are available for sure. But um, I think of it as, is like, if you have a problem, more than likely someone else has had that same problem. So it's just trying to identify like, Okay, where did somebody have this problem and see if you can solve it from there. Also, to improve your chances, like just remove stuff that's specific to your problem because that's just not going to help your search. Uh, there's also two um, packages that are available to help you like do this in the console. Um, there's this package called Errorist. I don't necessarily think that this would be really useful, but what you can do is you can you can um, bring in this library called Errorist. And what you do is if you, this is just a, a dummy function to error out because when you run it, it's going to have an error. What it will do is it will just, once you have the error, it will automatically search what that error or that warning is for you. I personally think that that would be kind of annoying, but yeah. if you just want something <laughs> that's automatic, you errors can do it. Um, search R has some functions that just, you can do search from the console, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, like if you wanted to search Google, you could just do search Google and then type in your query string, search GitHub. You can do that here and then search Stack Overflow. And I'm actually going to bring in my R Studio because I thought that was kind of cool. Um, yeah, but basically, what does that look like? So basically, you have this. Here's the code. If I run it, it just opens up your browser to that search. So here's the Google search. Let's do search GitHub. It just brings up and you just put whatever you want in the query string, right? So like if you had like a specific error, you could dump the error in it. But here's the search for um, in GitHub and then Stack Overflow, which is going to have me do verification because it's going to make you do the human verification, but it does the query string to Stack Overflow. So if you wanted to, there's some convenience in that. Um, I was kind of using search Google for a little bit because you could stay within your console and that's kind of nice um it's kind of quick and you don't have to like open up a tab and do all that but um it kind of saves you a little bit of time which is kind of nice next one this one is in the book but read the docs <laughs> i mean sometimes um sometimes the bug is just a result of you not fully un understanding how to use a specific function <laughs> and so <laughs> <laughs> so it's just good read the docs uh, i can't remember what's the what's the acronym uh, TFM? Is that what it is? Yeah. I know. Yeah. Our so TFM. 
Yeah, that's the one. And you can look that up on your own because um, <laughs> there's some interesting language choices for that. But, um, you know, sometimes if you if you really are stuck and the Google search isn't leading to it, read the docs. I mean, you know, use that question mark on the console and then try and read the examples. If it's a really good package or a function that's documented really well, like the examples should be really, really good. And you can look at those examples and kind of get a better sense of like, how is this function intended to be used? And that might help you better understand like where those bugs are coming from. The next step, make it repeatable. Um, you know, it's good to do a couple things when you're doing this is what, to make your process more systematic, kind of focus on making it like the scientific method. And so don't let your assumptions drive your debugging, actually set up some test cases to figure out where the root cause is and find ways to iterate, to test your hypotheses as fast as, as possible, right? So uh, it seems like it takes a lot of upfront time, but it's just good to kind of narrow in or create examples or also known as reproducible examples to try and figure out where exactly is your code error erroring out. Um, there is a package to help you with this called Reprex. And I'm going to open this up. Um, this is a package that can help you create reproducible examples that you can share with other people, whether that be in R for DS, whether that be on Stack Overflow. But this is a package that allows you to create like reproducible examples um, so that you can share and get help from other people. I think about when I do reproducible examples, I know at first, my first instinct is like, oh, this is just going to take more time. But usually if you create a reproducible example, it one, helps you learn the code a little bit more, but it also 80 to 85% of the time for me, I solve the problem by just kind of like creating a simpler example and trying to solve it. Yeah. And if I can't solve it, at least I have that simplified example that I can throw up on you know, r for ds and hopefully somebody can solve it for me. Um, and it just makes it easier and faster for others to help you solve the problem. Other one is figure out where it is. So uh, you should be ans asking the question or you should answer this question when you're debugging, what file, what line number, um, because that's gonna help you locate where the problem is. If you can locate it, that's half the battle because if you know where it's at, then you can start poking at it. You can start you know, throwing test cases at it. You can do all kinds of things to try and debug that certain, that certain problem. Then you generate those hypotheses, design those experiments to test them, record your results. And, you know, like it's like I said before, you know, this may take, this may seem like it's a lot of upfront cost, but in reality, it will save you a lot of time. Then the last thing is fix the bug. Check that you fix the bug, throw additional cases at it to make sure that you actually did fix it. Then if you are working, if you have the ability to do it, um, use an automated testing framework to uh, make sure you don't introduce any other bugs um, by kind of documenting this bug through the use of, an, of a formal test. There's a framework called Test That. Um, this is uh, a package that provides unit testing and other forms of testing, especially if you're doing like package development, where you can write test cases for specific bugs that you have come across that you want to make sure that um, you have fixed and that you don't introduce additional bugs later down the road working around that kind of code. Um, the, it's really kind of interesting because it's not that we don't necessarily test our code. It's just the fact that we don't automate it. So this really comes up in the discussion when you read the R packages book is um, as you're developing an R package, you have a lot of different dependencies or functions depend on other functions or code depends on other codes. And that introduces, that complexity introduces more chances for you to create bugs. And so if you can document and automate your testing framework so that if you do accidentally introduce a bug, that testing framework will catch it automatically. And then you can fix your code to make sure that your, your tests pass. pass. Um, if you're interested in this, there is three chapters in the R4DS packages book that really talks about testing basics in the context of our package development. Highly suggest reading it. There is a lot of good information in this about how to set up a testing framework. So uh, any questions about this, about like kind of the general framework or any additional comments? No, sounds good. I wish I knew all this 
earlier, like I said, when I was <clears throat> wandering in the wilderness trying to fix bugs. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> So the next kind of thing that the book kind of talks about is this idea of locating errors. Um, the function traceback allows us to help us find or prints out a t uh, call stack to help us find where these issues are happening or to give us more context. So the book has this example here where we have a bunch of nest or have a bunch of like function definitions. And basically what this will do is when we call F, it will call all of these functions and um, inevitably it will throw an error. And so what the book does is it shows this error. And so um, in our studio, if you're using our studio, you'll get this kind of output right here that allows you to do show chase back or run with debug. With those two options, if you run show trace back, what you'll get back is a call stack. And this is basically the steps that R took leading up to the error. And so um, basically, you can see here's your first call here at the bottom, and here's the next call, next call, next call, next call, up into the actual error itself. What's nice about this is that traceback or the printed call stack will give you an actual location, the specific line number to which um, the specific part of the call stack was at. So here at this point here, when we actually hit this error in this um, in this function, you can see it's telling it that it happened in line number six. And so you go find that line, it will give you an idea of that's where you should be initially looking for to debug. If you're not using our studio, you can just call the function. Um, I've used this because I don't, my main editor isn't our studio. And so I've used traceback before. So if you don't use our studio, you could just call traceback and it will give you that call stack. It just won't look as it's Wait, pretty. What's your main editor? Where, yeah, that's what I'm using. Uh, I use, I use, uh, I use an editor called Envim. Um, NeoVim. Oh, that's right. I remember you talking about that. Yeah, I'm mostly, I mean, mostly like the presentations here. I'll, I'll kind of use like R Studio, but I've transitioned over to NeoVim and the package called NVimR. Mm. Um, I would, <laughs> looking back, I would. I would probably suggest not starting with that uh, or it's, it's a lot of setup, um, but I like it. If you're, if, if anybody's interested and if, if anybody's interested in watching this later, like I'd be happy to kind of show you a little bit more about it. Cause it's a pretty powerful tool. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you're, what's nice about this is that you can use these functions if you don't have, if you're not using the R studio editor. Um, but yeah, I use NeoVim. I like it a lot. Um, and I use a, a plugin called NVMR, which is really, really cool. But we can talk about it a little bit later if y'all are interested. So, yeah. uh, You read the call stack from top to bottom, or bottom to top, excuse me. Um, and then the other thing is, is if your code is calling like a source file, what's nice about this call stack or traceback, it will give you the file name, and then it will actually give you the line number within that file. This is really nice in the context of um, Shiny development, if you're developing a Shiny app, um, because Shiny apps allow you to use what are called modules, and modules are just like separate files. And what's nice about that is the traceback will point to the specific file and then the specific line number that that error is happening. And so it makes it a lot easier if you have a code base that's distributed across many different files. And so... I've come across this a lot in Shiny development um, when you're doing it because it's really nice to pinpoint exactly where it's happening. So, uh, any other questions about this one? Locating errors. I think traceback is pretty straightforward. It's just basically giving you more information of where to potentially look for your your issues. Sounds good. So debugging with lazy evaluation. Um, this one was a little bit of a struggle for me because I don't think Arlang with abort is a function that's available anymore. Um, I was digging around to try and find it and I couldn't find it. So unless this is an older part of the, or since this is like an older portion of Arlang, I had a little bit of trouble kind of figuring this out. But one drawback of traceback is it's always gonna linearize the call tree. 
So what it's going to do is sometimes it may provide you more information or more context than you necessarily need. And so um, in this case, this is caused by, you know, lazy out or this is caused by lazy evaluation. It's going to show every single call that it has within it. And so here's our example here. We're going to call this function K, which uses those previous functions that we had defined. It's going to error out, obviously. But if we do a traceback, and I'm going to pull up our studio because the traceback didn't print here. Let's see if I can get it to do it again. So we do this, find this. Here's the error. Do, do, do. Debugging, here it is. Oops, there's the error. If I do traceback, you can see it provides a lot of additional context about what is getting actually ran. Now, in this case, it's pretty trivial, but if you have a lot of different calls that lead up to this error, you might be parsing through this huge call stack that might not be helpful for you. And so what's nice is rlang provides some convenience functions to help you. Um, you can use with abort, which I've already talked about. I don't think no longer exists, but somebody can help me find that. I dug through the news file for rlang and I couldn't find anything about a de depreciation or anything. But yeah, weird. you can use this function called lost error or last trace, which will help you simplify that call stack um, if you need that to happen. But I don't know what happened with abort. Um, I just couldn't find it. And in fact, if you try and run it in the R, in the R studio, it will tell you that it's no longer a part of the package. So mm. with abort mm. is not an exported object from namespace R lang. So I don't think it's, and I looked into the package documentation. I couldn't find a reference to with underscore abort. So not hundred percent sure. So. So you think it's now this last error one? I think I know the book doesn't talk about last error, but I think not sure. So, um, all right, now the fun stuff, uh, the interactive debugger. So sometimes we need some more info to fix the bug. And what's nice about this is what if we could find a way to pause the execution of a specific, of a specific function so that we could take a look around. Well, what's nice is there's this function called browser to help us kick off this interactive debugger. So if you're using RStudio, what you can do is, is if you click that rerun with debug, it will automatically kick you off into an interactive D browser or an interactive browser, but you can also dump in this browser function to automatically kick you into it. So I'm gonna show you this example here. So I have this function this G function, which is just a trivial function. And what I do is inside this function, I dump in this browser call. And what's nice about this is when I run this, R Studio and R itself will kick you into an interactive D browser. And so you know you're in an in interactive D or browser if you see this kind of prompt that says browse bracket one and so on and so forth. Now, what's nice about this is the interactive debrowser helps you kind of like walk through the state of the function. And so right now there's nothing in here, but if I go like N, it will take me to my next step. If I do N again, it will take me to my next step. Now inside the scope of this function, I should have this variable called nums. So nums, you can see I have is just a, um, a numeric vector one through 10. Uh, you can also do things like um, ls to see what's inside of it. So you can run this ls function and you can see that you both have this object b and this object nums. If I type b, I can see what it is. I can see it's this value 10, so on and so forth. So browser just like suspends the function. So you're right now kind of just suspending it to kind of see what's in here so you can walk through it like step by step to kind of look at and see what's going on with it. Obviously for this very simple function, it doesn't, you know, you really might not need a browser function, but if you have this really big function and you're not necessarily sure what's happening, you could take this browser call and dump it into specific locations to stop your function running at that specific spot and kind of play around with it. How do you get out of an interactive debrowser? Um, there's these functions here, are these kind of on the RStudio, you can just click stop. 
Um, but I also find that capital Q will kick you out and it will take you back to your original code. So browser is a really nice kind of function to help you kind of like look, peek inside of a function and kind of play around with it and see what's going on. So uh, any questions about like that kind of very simplified example of using browser? Do any of you use browser, Ryan, Ron? Yeah, I've used it. I, I, I've used it unintentionally, like because like sometimes I'll screw something up and it'll pop up just sort of like me trying to run something or do something, and I'm always like cursing and you know I had never really known what to do with it, and you know until until now. Yeah, it's it it. I honestly I love browser. Like it's probably one of my go to tools to debug functions. Um, I like using it a lot. And it kind of goes back to like what the book set, said at the start, like you shouldn't have to use browser with new code, you know? So it's it, usually the book or the book was kind of suggesting that like when you're writing new code, if you're having this issue where you're constantly using browser to figure out what's wrong with it, then you might want to rethink your approach. But if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with other people's code, or you're trying to figure out code that you wrote like a long time ago, browser might be a way to help, kind of help you like dig into it a little bit more to see what's going on. So um, browser is also nice because because it's a function, you can use it with a conditional. So if you're trying to see how your function works in a specific state, in this case where this value or this argument B is less than zero, in any case where B is less than zero, it will kick off a browser. So if you have a very specific type of state that you want to test your function in, you can use browser inside of conditional. Um, I've already kind of went all through all this stuff um, about browser. How do you know you're in a browser? So I'm not going to go over it. But um, just know that when you do use browser and when you're in that interactive browser, there's different steps that you can take or different commands that you can use. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these, but um, the ones that I use quite a bit is like next, which is going to walk you through each step. So if I go back to my example here, I'll constantly do this thing where if I'm in an interactive de browser, if I do n next step, n next step, n next step, and because that was the last step, it would run it through. Um, some other ones that I use too is like finish. So say you want to finish like a loop or if you have a conditional inside or a loop or kind of a while loop inside of your function. If you run that F, it will finish that. And so you don't have to sit there and constantly go loop, loop, loop. It will just finish the loop and then move on to the next step. And then the other one that I use quite a bit is continue. So say you're pretty much, you've kind of fixed the issue inside of brow or inside of your function. If you hit C, it's just going to do the entire execution and then kick you out of the interactive browser. If you just want to overall quit, just use capital Q or you stop and it kicks you out and then you're back into your original state of your console. There's some other functions that I don't really use. There's enter, which will repeat your previous command. I don't really use it. Um, it sounds like the previous cohort didn't use it as well, but this was one that I did learn about, this where function, which allows, or this where command, which will output a, uh, stack trace for any active calls within your interactive browser. So if I go back to the simplified example here, kick myself into an interactive browser, do next, do next, and type where, it will give me a trace back of what calls were already called inside of there. So I'll go Q, exit out of it, kick me back to the original state. Okay. Um, there's some alternatives to this. Um, you can set breakpoints in RStudio. Uh, many of us get introduced to breakpoints by accidentally clicking on them. Um, so if you go over here, if you want to add a breakpoint, all you have to do is click here um, to anywhere, any line to add a breakpoint. And anywhere that you add a breakpoint is like dumping in an interactive browser. Um, what will happen is your code will run, and then once it hits this breakpoint, it will start in an interactive debugger at this specific breakpoint. Uh, breakpoints have a lot of benefits. They, one, they uh, don't put 
like code inside of your code. So you don't have like a bunch of browser calls like dumped in here. You just know that this is set. Um, and then what's nice is you can do like multiple, you can do multiple. So you can set multiple breakpoints to stop or to pause execution at different steps. So that's kind of nice as well. I really don't use breakpoints very often. I've tried to use them in the past, but I don't use them as much as I probably should, but you know, different, different options for different people. You can change your options to recover, which basically means that anytime you get an error, it will just automatically kick you into an interactive browser. Um, I would not like that, but if you are somebody that would like that, you can potentially use that. And then there's this function called debug and debug once, I think is the other one we'll talk about here in a second, that will automatically just put in a browser at the top of the function call. So here are the breakpoints. Um, I kind of already talked about all of these already, kind of showed you how to set a breakpoint. There's also this like keyboard shortcut, Shift F9. So if you're on a specific line and you want to put a breakpoint, you can go Shift F9, it will set that breakpoint. Um, or you kind of talked about the benefits of using it. Some of the down, some of the downsides of breakpoints in some unusual circumstances, breakpoints won't work. If you need more information about that, you can read this here. And the other thing is our studio doesn't support conditional breakpoints. So if you're interested in having a conditional breakpoint, that is not a feature that is supported by our studio, at least um, from the way I understand it. So does anybody here use breakpoints? Like Ron, Ryan, have you used breakpoints before? I've used them a lot, but not in R. <laughs> um, I haven't really not been so using much, them in R. Really. I just haven't written anything that big in R that needed it. You know what I mean? Yeah, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. sure, but you're using C++ or even big Python scripts. Definitely need to dig in and see what's going on. For sure. Also, they yeah. don't really, I thought there was some problem with breakpoints in like R Markdown anyway, right? Can you not do them with R Markdown, I thought? Yeah, I, I was, when I was messing around with it, because I haven't used them in a while, like in the chapter, I was trying to set them. You can't. Yeah, so you can't, so I, I do everything in R Markdown, so you can't even use it in R Markdown. So it's like, it has to be an R file. Like, eh, browser works fine. <laughs> yep, uh, browser for me, that's like my go-to is <laughs> browser. <laughs> it's just basically the only, thing I don't, the only thing I don't like about browser is if I'm like developing code and I accidentally leave it in there yeah. and then I run it again. I'm like, oh shoot, I gotta go back and delete it. But yeah, it's the only annoyance that I have. So I, I have to be perfectly honest with you. I, I I'm still very likely to stick in print statements <laughs> to see what's going on. <laughs> Hey, That's... print debugging is a method for debugging and it yeah. works. Oh yeah, it's it... in this chapter actually, but yeah, I've done that since day one. <laughs> <laughs> since programming, you know, TRS-80 basic. That's <laughs> how long ago I've been using print debugging. <laughs> it, it works. <laughs> yeah. I have used print debugging, especially within Shiny apps. Like it comes up all the time where in certain contexts, you can't use browsers. So you have to use, you have to rely on print debugging to work. So, yeah. But different flavors for different people, you know. Um, there's this option recover. Again, I talked about this. I don't necessarily think I would be a fan of this, but if you wanted to, you could just automatically set it to recover it um, anytime that you run across an error. But I'm not a fan of it. But if you want this, there is an option to set this. If you want to try it out and you want to turn it off, you can do options error equals null and you're good to go. So, so the debug, the de, uh, debug function. So um, what's nice about debug is it's going to insert a browser statement in the first line of the specified function. Um, why would this be nice? Uh, say you don't have access to the source code for a specific function that you would like to use. So what you can do is, is you can initially wrap that function around, or you can wrap debug around that function. And so then the next time that you call that function, it will open up an interactive browser for you to kind of explore it. Um, I have an example to show this here in a second, but say you do this, um, just know that once you wrap a function in debug, it will continually <laughs> kick you into an interactive debugger until you turn it off. So there's this function on debug, which removes it. And then there's this one function called debug once, which basically will dump the browser in it, 
kick you in an interactive browser once you call that function. And then any subsequent calls won't have that browser function. So um, there's also this function called set breakpoint. So you could say you're trying to source a specific file or you're running it from the specific or running it from your console. You can use set breakpoint to say, hey, put this breakpoint at this specific line in this specific file, and it will do the same thing. It will kick off an interactive deep browser. Um, there was some discussion about trace, but I'm not going to get into it, but just know that um, basically you can set trace to give you a trace back or a call stack um, when you're kind of doing this interactive debugger with debug and on debug. Um, so here's my example of debug. So I'm going back to this thing here. So dplyr, I don't necessarily have the source code for filter. So what I do is I just set just wrap the function name in debug. So the next time that I run um, filter empty cars displacement here, it will kick me into the interactive de debugger for the filter statement. And so, you know, now I can do like next, next, and kind of walk through this function to see what's actually happening, right? And so you can see it actually going through and walking you through the steps for the filter function um, and kind of see what's actually happening. What's nice is you can see what's inside of it, you know, do LS, check what buy is, you can see it's a quotient, so da, 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 da. And so it just gives you the ability to kind of like explore a function that you don't necessarily have the source code to. So that's kind of nice. And I'm gonna quit out of here. Um, and then I have to do on debug because if, if I don't, anytime that I run, that filter statement again, it will continually do it until um, I on debug it. So, but if you want to get around that, you could use debug once and you're good to go. Um, compiled code, the book kind of um, the book kind of says like, hey, this is outside the scope of this conversation of debugging. Um, but if you do need to debug some compiled code. There are interactive debuggers that you can, it or says that you can use an interactive debugger with, with compiled code. And what the book does is it says, hey, we're not going to talk about this, but there are various resources that you can access to help you um, better understand it. So um, I don't work with compiled code a lot, but if you do, know there's resources available. Um, some There was some discussion about non-interactive debugging. Uh, so in certain situations, this is where you can't run your code interact interactively. It may be more challenging to debug. And so it's still important in those cases, even if you can't interactively, so go step by step, it's still important to kind of follow your process, right? So going back to that initial process and working through it and seeing if you can solve it. Um, there's some convenience functions that can help you out. There's this function called call R or caller R. And basically what this function will do is it will pass this function in a fresh ses or a fresh session. And so if you wanted to test the function out outside of the context of what you're running it in, you can run this call R, R function and it will run it like it's in a new session. Some other issues, if you're working with non, or if you're working in a situation where you can't work with the code interactively, but you're still running across bugs, some things that you might want to check. Check your global environment. Like, is something different? Have you loaded different packages? So I know, Ryan, you've mentioned, is it the conflict R package yeah, or the something? Conflicted, I think. It's, yeah, conflicted or something conflicted. like that. Conflicted. Yeah. So there, are, you may have inadvertently, when you bring in a specific package, you may have overwritten like a specific function definition. So that made a change to your global environment. Um, so you might have to kind of check what's going on in your global environment to see if there's any issues. Uh, and then, you know, were there previous objects left from previous sessions causing differences? So it's usually the best way to do this that I found is just restart it, restart R, restart a new session, and then run your code again to up to the point where you're working at. Because sometimes if you're like interactively working with code, you might have a variable definition somewhere that is causing the bug. And so you want to just like start fresh. 
Other thing is check your working directory. So if you want to check your working directory, you can use this function called git wd. Um, that will print your working directory. So if I type in git wd inside of here, it will show you where I'm working in. And you can see I'm using it. Here's basically where our studio is pointing to to access files, so on and so forth. Um, also, there's this function or there's this package called here. So I absolutely love the here package because what it does is it allows you to here, um, yeah, cool. Yep, to better manage your uh, working directory in the past that you call. <laughs> and so it is a nice I'm a huge a nice, I'm a I I I only ever use here. Yeah, I love this package. Yeah, it simplifies so many things. Um so for people that are watching this, you can already hear there's three people who absolutely love this package. Uh, check it out. It is here, here, it, here, here. <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, it's. So um, it, I, I think it's. I think uh, you know. Well, first of all, I just think it's good practice to not deal with like long ass, um, you know, <sighs> um, absolute, you know, what do you call it, um, locations or addresses or whatever, and like the rel the relative. Um, I forget what the the whole terminology is, but yeah, no, it just makes things so much simpler in terms of because I have a lot of different like subfolders in my program uh, my project so I might, I might have to call like multiple you know um, folders to, to open stuff or whatever so yeah absolutely and it kind of goes back to this this idea of um, to help solve those problems use a project-based development <laughs> and this is a very uh, this is a very famous um, blog post that's been written. It gets mentioned quite a bit by Jenny Bryan herself, who is just uh, just an awesome person in, in, in our community. But if you haven't read this, I highly suggest reading this. This is one of the top five um, blog posts that I will share with anybody that oh, yeah. um, is getting starting with R. Like This is the one to kind of help you out with <laughs> having that mindset of being project oriented, right? And so the common saying basically is, is that Jenny Bryan will, uh, if she finds out that you're, what is it? If you're setting WD or you're remo mm -hmm. removing it, she'll come and set your computer on fire. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, it's funny how that's like six years ago. Now, I, I remember when that happened. It was like everyone was talking about that that blog. It's, it seems like <laughs> that long ago, but yeah, it was it's quite a while ago. Yeah. So if if you haven't seen this yet, I highly, highly suggest reading this because it will save many headaches um will save you many headaches for sure um and then there's some other discussion about like some other like global like system variables like this path environment variable you know make sure that that's set i don't really mess with that stuff but just know that you can set up global like when i say global i'm talking global to your entire system so your computer itself um check those if that's an issue and then this also this R lives environment variable um, you can set. So I think I've actually set this one because I've set it to the specific place where I want CRAN packages to be downloaded. But just know, I guess the conversation with these is that just know that there's global system variables that could be influencing like or could be introducing bugs into your code as well. And that's a place to look if you know where to look. So yeah. Where am I at time wise? You are. I have no idea what time it is. You've got six minutes. Six minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump over dump frames because I tried to get this to work and I couldn't get it to work. But I guess like the gist of it is, is basically like you can use this function to dump it into like this RDA file format. And then what you can do is, is that you can use this function load, load in that RDA file and then run the debugger. And then it will walk you through the interactive debugger. Um, and this allows you to like cheat any non, like if you're going to be working with code non interactively to kind of help out to see what's wrong with it. I don't personally have a use case for it, but if you do, here's the function to do this if you're interested. Like Ron mentioned, print debugging is another option. Um, basically, what this is is that you're just inserting numerous like print statements to print out what you want from your function calls or your code in and of itself. And so uh, 
Although it works, know that at times it can be slow and primitive, but no, it works and it works in non-interactive uh, situations. So this might be something that you have to rely on. So it is a way to debug. Um, and this can also be useful in cases where you can't get a good trace back. So if you're having trouble parsing through that call stack, print debugging might be what you need. And so here's the example the book has. Cat is just another function to print things to the console. And that's what it's doing with each function calls. It's just outputting, hey, calling function F, calling function G, calling function I, so that when you run this, and I don't have the output here, it will output what you want to output from your functions. So this might be useful. Um, I'd use this in Shiny context for sure, um, because that because when you're developing in a Shiny app, you run into the situation of working in a reactive context and you can't use an interactive debugger sometimes when you're working with that. And so you have to do print debugging to figure out what's wrong. But like Ron mentioned, uh, you know, this is a way to debug. So it's, it's, it's a method to do it and definitely use it if you need to. So, uh, There's also some stuff about our markdown in here as well. Um, I'm not going to cover this too much because um, you can read more about it in the book, but I also think because with the transition to Quarto, this might be a little bit different now, but if you, well, our markdown is still going to be around, so I should, shouldn't be saying that Quarto is just going to be everything. Um, but if you are debugging our markdown, there's some tools to help you do this. Uh, I really didn't understand these too much because I've never used sync before. Um, but basically the book mentions that if you're trying to interactive or if you're trying to debug an R Markdown file, you should be using R Markdown render to this path of the specific file to run that code in your current session. And then if you want, you'll need to do some extra steps to do some error handling. So you'll have to put in this function sync and potentially this function recover in your options when you set it so that when you do your R markdown render, it will allow you to debug your R markdown code. I've never used this before, yeah, but know. it's an option for you to use. Um, and then if you want the trace back when you're doing this, the same thing, you'll just set trace back into your options as well. Um, and then you'll just pair this all together in your options when you do render your R Markdown file to help you um, better uh, debug it. So I've never done this, but has anybody else ever used this stuff when they're debugging our Markdown code? Um, I took yeah. a class like years and years ago, and I remember reading about traceback, but that's that's about it. Yeah, I think I, I did some exercises to try to work with it, but that's about it. Yeah. I usually just look at the output. Like I'm always, what I try and do, and I don't really do it in the notes here, but I try and like put like naming conventions in here so that if a certain code chunk does fail when it's rendering, it will tell you exactly what code chunk it is. And then you can jump in where that is exactly, but um, different tools for different people. So uh, we're kind of up at the, yeah. I really got about a minute left here. Um, but this is the last topic and we could talk about this next week. Yeah. Um, kind of finish this up. But I do want to point out one last thing. Um, I'll make sure to make a note that we talked about non-error failures, but no, there are some resources out there that talk more about this. And the second number one or the second kind of like top five things that I would ever point anybody to uh, to learn about R is this object of type closure subsetable talk from Jenny Bryan have to watch it. If you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. It is an awesome explanation of the different debugging tools that are available to you. And like I said, Jenny Bryan is just really good at what she does. And she's uh, really great for the art community. And she puts together really great talks. And this is probably one of the top five talks that I suggest everybody to check out. So these other ones I'm not too familiar with, but um, I had to point this out for sure. Check this one out if you get a chance. Yeah, I do. I remember that one. That's a good yep. one. It's my top five. <laughs> it's one of my top fives um, for Is sure. That on the, uh, I think we linked that to the uh, 
Yeah, I think it was. Um, what's yeah, his it's name? It's linked on the. Uh, it's linked on the mentors, Jack. Because I, when I ran into it, I'm like we got to make sure everybody watches this thing. <laughs> it it is by far like the top. So, um, it's yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it's really good, and and she 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 also does a really awesome job of like making it accessible. Like, it it's just really great. It's like I said, it's really, it's a really, really good, good conversation about how to use the different debugging tools. So, well, that's, yeah. I'll cover the non error fail failures next week. That will literally take me five minutes, maybe. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll then, get into, I'll get into the uh, next chapter, which I'm now, I've already forgotten <laughs> what that is, but I will, I will take a look. Measuring performance. Yes. Yeah, and I can reach out to Stone or afterwards to see if he's going to do improving performance. Um, and then we're really close. We only have literally three more mm. chapters left, which it's hard to believe because we started no. in October of last year and we're pretty dang close. So yeah, it's good to, good to think. So cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I can hang out here for a little bit if y'all want to chat, um, but that's pretty much all I have uh for now until we talk about the non in the the non-interactive or the non-error failures and stuff so yeah well i'll see you guys uh next week yep you ready to go right. talk to you later ryan take care take care yeah. take care guys see ya i'm gonna end